evening and welcome to InfoWars Nightly News with me, your host, Paul Joseph Watson, on this Friday, February 17th edition. Coming up, Rob Dew interviews James Wesley Rawls about his new book, which deals with the coming financial collapse and survival techniques. It's a book of fiction, but also contains some very real solutions for everybody to be involved with. Now, the news, our top headline tonight. FEMA follows DHS in monitoring news coverage of its activities 24-7. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, has followed in the footsteps of the DHS in looking to hire a private contractor that will monitor news coverage of the agency's activities on a 24-7 basis. Quote, FEMA is planning to award a 100% small business set-aside contract to a media monitoring firm that can monitor, archive and measure all local news in major Nielsen markets, all nationally broadcast news and all cable outlets for their news coverage of FEMA activities in the field across the US, reports Government Security News. Uh, and the program is similar in nature to a DHS monitoring effort that stoked controversy and a congressional hearing after it emerged that the DHS had hired an outside contractor, General Dynamics Advanced Information Systems, to monitor social media outlets along with a wit list of web sites including the Drudge Report on a 24-7, 365 basis in order to uncover, quote, any media reports that reflect adversely on the US government or the department. And so we have this raft of uh, federal agencies, we'll talk about the FBI in a minute, uh, suddenly in a scramble to keep a constant watch on what people are uh, reporting on or saying about the government online. And as we heard during the um, DHS subcommittee hearing yesterday, this is not aimed at newspaper people, you know, people who produce news content. It's not aimed at bloggers. I mean, it's only going to make us talk about it even more. It's going to make us talk about the federal government in a negative context even more. I mean, this is aimed at creating a chilling effect wherein the average American will be more reluctant to criticize their government because of the fear that they could face some kind of reprisal. Uh, and in the particular case of FEMA, this agency was, of course, caught completely botching the response to Hurricane Katrina. Of course, we know they got massive new funding and powers as a result of that, but their image did take a pounding. So now they're trying to massage their image back into a good state. But what is FEMA preparing for that requires them to monitor the internet 24-7 uh, to gauge the reaction to their activities? Well, could it be the rollout of clergy response teams during a national emergency? These are pastors and religious representatives trained by the federal government, as we reported in 2006, to, quote, quell dissent and pacify citizens to obey the government in the event of a declaration of martial law. And that, of course, is something that can't be dismissed as a conspiracy theory because it's an admitted program. So we got FEMA very interested in keeping tabs on what people are thinking of its activities. And this relates very much to our next story, which is FBI to spy on gold bugs via suspicious comments app. Given the fact that the FBI has characterized the view that the US should return to the gold standard as an extremist belief held by potential domestic terrorists, should gold bugs be concerned about the agency's efforts to create a new app that tracks suspicious comments made on social media websites? A document posted online recently by the Federal Bureau of Investigation seeks developers to create an app that will have the capability to, quote, rapidly assemble critical open source information and intelligence to quickly vet, identify, and geolocate breaking news events, incidents, and emerging threats. And again, just like the DHS, just like FEMA, the FBI is joining the stampede to have the news, blogs, and social media websites constantly monitored on a full-time basis for keywords of their choosing. And uh, just like the DHS stonewall, the congressional hearing yesterday by trying to restrict the debate to disaster relief, the FBI is doing the same with this program. But we know from last week's announcement out the FBI's counter-terror division, in addition to the FBI's Communities Against Terrorism program, that people who think, um, people who they think should be monitored as potential domestic terrorists are the same people who post tweets and Facebooks about 
believing in the gold standard. And of course, we had the story about buying a cup of coffee with cash at an internet cafe and also buying food in bulk. All of these activities are deemed suspicious and potentially indications of terrorism by the FBI. Um, so that's, that's what they're going to be interested in when it comes to monitoring social media. Former FBI agent Mike German said comments made on a Twitter account deemed suspect by the FBI could create, quote, a cloud of suspicion over people merely using social media to express their First Amendment rights, warning that the feds could use the data to, quote, increase video surveillance in a neighborhood. And this is what he said. Quote, part of what we want to protect is the freedom to speak your mind, to criticize government policies without the fear that the government will take it the wrong way and start treating you as if you're a threat, German told Fox News. But of course, as we know, the DHS see something, say something videos, the FBI flyers going out to businesses like internet cafes, tattoo parlors, um, military surplus stores, etc. The Mayak report and a host of other examples spanning back years prove that informed Americans who are angry or dissatisfied at the federal government have already been identified and targeted as the primary terror threat. So that's what the FBI, the DHS and FEMA are going to be interested in with this monitoring program of social media, Facebook, Twitter comments, etc. Moving on. To our next story, Virginia House passes NDAA nullification 96 to 4. In a move completely ignored by the establishment media, the Virginia House of Delegates has voted in favor of House Bill 1160, legislation that codifies in Virginia law non compliance with the kidnapping provisions of sections 102 and 1022. Sorry, 1021 and 1022 of the National Defense Authorization Act of 2012, NDAA. The final vote held on February 14th was 96 to 4. The bill was sponsored by Delegate Bob Marshall and was introduced on January 16th of this year. Virginia Governor Bob McConnell is on record as opposing the legislation. And as we know, he was, of course, on Obama's infamous uh, Council of Governors for this Marshall Law Plan that they've got. And HB 1160 reads as follows, a bill to prevent any agency, political subdivision, employee or member of the military of Virginia from assisting an agency of the armed forces of the United States in the conduct of the investigation, prosecution or detention of a citizen in violation of the United States Constitution, the Constitution of Virginia or any Virginia law or regulation. And... Uh, We've got other states with legislation pending for NDAA nullification, which, of course, is the, um, in specific terms, the indefinite detention provision of the NDAA. So it's been passed in uh, Virginia, and this is the perfect opportunity for info warriors to lobby their state lawmakers um, to get these bills passed in other states and kill the indefinite detention provision of the NDAA. And you can find more information on what stage those different bills are at in your particular state um, by visiting the website 10thamendmentcenter.com. Military top brass tell troops not to march in Ron Paul rally. An email leaked by multiple active duty personnel shows that the military has issued a warning to troops encouraging them not to take part in the upcoming Veterans for Ron Paul 2012 march in Washington on Monday. Quote, this is from the email, as a reminder, active duty personnel are prohibited by DOD Directive 1344.10, paragraph 41210, from marching in a partisan political parade, regardless of whether they are in uniform or civilian clothes, reads the email, which was sent from a Navy.mil address and eventually found its way to the organizer, Adam Kokesh, who, of course, has featured on this show. Um, and you can go to infowars.com, read the full email. But in this email, they add that even non-active duty and retired military. Of course, this whole march is veterans for Ron Paul. It's about, you know, mainly people who've retired from the military. Even they cannot march according to this intimidation tactic by the military. Um, even if they're not in uniform, they can't march. It says they cannot be seen to be endorsing a candidate, which of course is impossible. 
that's what the march is all about, endorsing Ron Paul. So the military is basically threatening people who've been out of the military for years, veterans, that they can't publicly support Ron Paul. And so again, despite the fact that Ron Paul has the most financial support from the military out of all the Republican candidates combined, more than Obama, more than everybody else put together, Romney, Gingrich, all of them, the top brass are trying to prevent Ron Paul from being seen in the eyes of the American people as having the support of the military. And so it's fine, you know, to have Barack Obama doing a photo op with the troops. But God forbid, should veterans who've been retired for years have anything to do with Ron Paul. And of course, this is not the first time that the army has tried to sabotage and intimidate people for partaking in a Ron Paul rally. Remember the End the Fed rallies of 2008, which of course were organized by Ron Paul supporters. Ron Paul himself um, was in attendance at several of them, as was Alex Jones. And of course, the United States Army Reserve Command sent out an advisory to alert law enforcement or other military and intelligence agencies that these protests were taking place. In that instance, they were treating the free exercise of the First Amendment as a potential terrorist threat, during which the army were ready to be mobilized. So again, they're trying to pull the same stunt with this Ron Paul march on Monday. So, I mean, people should, of course, not be intimidated by these tactics. They... You know, they're not going to court martial thousands of people who are not even active duty in the military anymore. And so we encourage everyone who can make it to attend the March Veterans for Ron Paul, which begins at the Washington Monument 12 noon and ends 3 p.m. at the White House on Monday. Next story, Israel, U.S. exploit false flag attacks, ramp up propaganda campaign, reports Kurt Nimmo, Infowars.com. In the wake of the amateurish terror attacks in India, Georgia and Thailand earlier in the week, Israel has ramped up its propaganda campaign to demonize Iran and Hezbollah by warning its citizens about the dangers of travel. Quote, Iran and Hezbollah are continuing to try to carry out other attacks on targets abroad, said a nameless counterterrorism official without offering details or credible evidence. That means asking Israelis abroad to be vigilant. And this ties in with an article that I wrote yesterday entitled, Iran teams up with Al-Qaeda claims dubious telegraph report. And they're now citing baseless intelligence sources to claim that Al-Qaeda the Sunni terrorist group has teamed up with Iran, the biggest Shia country on the planet, to attack the West. And specifically, they mentioned the target, which is apparently the London Olympics, which begins in July. Now, let's just brush aside the fact that Al-Qaeda and Iran are mortal enemies. Let's discount the fact that Al-Qaeda spokespeople like Zawahiri and the late al Zarqawi routinely denounce Iran in public. And who is it in actual fact that's been funding and training Al-Qaeda affiliated groups to carry out terror attacks? Who is it that's been funding and training Al-Qaeda rebels to take over Libya and Syria? I'll give you a clue. It isn't Iran. NBC News, remember, reported last week this is the same story we've been reporting for years. They just confirmed it via US officials that groups with direct ties to Al-Qaeda and specifically the group MEK are carrying out bombings and assassinations in Iran. And this is being bankrolled and directed from Israel. This, of course, is the same group, MEK, that's been backed financially by the United States since at least 2007. So while Israel and the US are admittedly funding and training Al-Qaeda-linked groups to attack Iran, the corporate media the same media who sold you weapons of mass destruction, Niger yellow cake and phony 45 minute warnings before the invasion of Iraq. Now they're saying that Iran has teamed up with Al Qaeda, even when the US government's publicly airlifting the same Al Qaeda rebels who helped them overthrow Gaddafi, who have turned Libya into a hellhole, airlifting them into Syria to take down Assad. And yet all along reporting that it's Iran that's teamed up with Al-Qaeda when in fact, in your face, it's the US and Israel as ever. And bearing all that in mind, this also ties into this story which broke just a few hours ago. 
Fox News feds arrest man allegedly heading to U.S. Capitol for suicide mission after sting investigation. Authorities have arrested a man allegedly on his way to the U.S. Capitol for what he thought would be a suicide attack on one of the nation's most symbolic landmarks, Fox News has learned exclusively. The man in his 30s and of Moroccan descent was nabbed following a lengthy investigation by the FBI initiated after he expressed interest in conducting an attack. It's unclear. How the FBI learned of his aspirations, though he came onto the radar screen of law enforcement in early December. So they say it's unclear how the FBI learned of his aspirations. Well, Fox News, I give you a hint. Do you think for a second that this is just like almost every other single terror bust that the FBI has been involved in since 9-11, um, that the FBI provided him with the means, the radicalization and the training? Um, to go ahead with this. And it's actually in the article itself that it's another fabricated terror plot run from beginning to end by the FBI. Quote, the man thought undercover FBI agents assisting him in his plot were associates of Al-Qaeda. And it, it goes on to admit that the FBI provided him with a disabled gun during their ongoing operation, Fox News has learned. And then it says also that the guy had fake explosives, which the FBI knew were duds. Well, how did they know? Because they gave them to him, just like every other similar case. Uh, and I'm sure, just like the bizarre incident in Bangkok, which had no connection to the Iranian government, it turned out, but the Israelis claimed it did anyway, that this, again, will be further used to grease the skids for an attack on Iran. Just like the um, completely manufactured Saudi ambassador assassination plot, remember, uh, Tony Schaefer came out and said that the FBI, his sources in the FBI had no information on it whatsoever. It, it was a ridiculous, ludicrous concoction that a used car salesman was going to start assassinating Saudi ambassadors in America. And again, that was used to grease the skids to demonize Iran as will this. I mean, you can add it to the growing list of contrived terror plots. Underwear bomber, again in focus yesterday. No passport. Well-dressed man helps him get on the plane. State Department ordered by the CIA to let him on. Uh, Toronto 18 in Canada. Bunch of mental incompetence. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police gave them the fertilizer explosive via their informant. Miami 7, supposedly going to attack the Sears Tower in Chicago. Semi-retarded gangbangers provocateur from start to finish by the FBI. Um, the Bronx plot to blow up synagogues and bring down airliners in New York. Ringleaders, two potheads, given fake explosives and an inactive missile by the FBI. Notice a trend emerging here. Fort Dix, 2007 plot to kill soldiers. FBI informants, again, the key figures behind the operation. They planted and nurtured the plot. And you can go down the list, whether it's England, Canada, US, same thing every time. Authorities provoke, provocateur, nurture the plot from beginning to end. And in the US, every single major terror bust has been a case of entrapment, which is exactly what this appears to be. The plot is, you know, completely fabricated by the FBI, foisted upon some poor, retarded individual who's given fake explosives and arrested. And, you know, it's the 21st century version of Marinus van der Lube and the Reichstag. And this is why the TSA gets to put its hands down your pants. This is why the FBI is spying on your Facebook and Twitter posts. And this is why the DHS is recruiting Americans to spy on each other. And it's one big fabricated hoax. The war on terror is contrived nonsense. And this um, Moroccan patsy that Fox News is excitedly reporting about is just the latest chapter in this work of fiction. Just before we sign off here, I encourage all of you who are watching this on YouTube to sign up at prisonedplanet.tv and get your subscription. Um, years and years of multimedia archives now available. Of course, you get the, the Alex Jones Show live video archives, special interviews, speeches, special events, and of course, 
the live stream of InfoWars Nightly News. Um, we've still got the Give the Gift of Truth special um, running at the moment. It's 39.95, which is, of course, 44% discount. And, of course, PrisonPlanet.tv is also available on Roku. So we encourage all of you who are watching on YouTube to support us. This is how we operate. This is how we fund the network. So sign up today at PrisonPlanet.tv. And that's going to do it for this edition of InfoWars Nightly News. I've been your host, Paul Joseph Watson, and we'll see you on the next edition. Take care. Hey, Newt, what'd you do with the Bohemian Grove? Why don't you I never answer that question, sir? Newt, never answer that question. Why do you keep dodging questions about the Bohemian Grove? Why do you keep dodging questions? Great speech, great speech. Hey, Mr. Speaker, what'd you do at the Bohemian Grove? Good to see you, Mr. Speaker. I like photographers, I'm one. How come you keep dodging questions about the Bohemian Grove, sir? You should have to, God bless you. Oops, sorry. What's the... Newt, seriously, why all the secrecy? And all the winds make merry with thy dust. Bring fire! You know, it's nice to know that there are some people who have fantasy lives that fantasy. have nothing it's to touch with. Nice to, video nice to be here. Bye bye. You can't answer the question? You can't? Can you answer the question? See you later. Uh, I know you consider yourself a Catholic, but what happens when you worship Moloch at the Bohemian Grove? <laughs> New York Post says uh, that male prostitutes are shipped in into the Bohemian Grove. Can you tell us what happens there? You actually believe all this junk? Bill Clinton said that Republicans run around naked in the woods there. Did you say the Bohemian Club? Yeah. That's where all those rich Republicans go out and stand naked against redwood trees, right? <laughs> I've never been to the Bohemian Club, but you ought to go. It'd be good for you. Get some fresh air. And you don't want to know what Richard Nixon said about the place. The Bohemian Grove that I attend, on time to time, the Easterners and the others that come there. But it is the most faggy goddamn thing you will ever imagine. I'm San Francisco crowd because it just tires the hell out of me. I mean, I can watch it in San Francisco. That's the place you attended. It's a secret society. Can you tell us at least who invited you? You know, it's nice to know that there are some people who have fantasy lives that fantasy. have nothing it's to touch with. Nice to, video nice to be here. Bye-bye. Bye you can't answer the question? You can't? You're done. You answer the question. See you later. Greetings, fellow Info Warriors. Alex Jones here announcing the first of many trips that I'm going to take across this wonderful United States that we live in. And we get so busy here at InfoWars.com, the nightly news, the daily radio show, the documentary films, and all the other things we're doing that I tend to never go out and give speeches anymore. And I've got a lot of ideas bubbling around in my head about the history of the New World Order, what makes them tick and how to defeat them. So I'm titling this key speech I'm going to give. It'll run around two hours long, Blueprint to Defeat the New World Order. And we're also going to have a surprise premiere of a short documentary film we've been working on at the event. First off, I'm going to be going to Dallas, Texas, Sunday, February 19th, 2012, to the historic Lakewood Theater. And the next Sunday, February 26th, I'm going to be in Orlando, Florida. You can find out more about the events and buy tickets at InfoWars.com forward slash events. Now, unfortunately, every event I've ever had, we've had to turn people away. So get your tickets early at InfoWars.com forward slash events.
There's a lot of crazy stuff going on in this world. And the craziest of all is this explosive awakening. I can't wait to meet you and shake your hand. I'll see you in Dallas and I'll see you in Orlando. Infowars.com forward slash events. Welcome back to InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your fill-in host, Rob Dew, and I'd like to thank Paul Watson for covering the news portion. There's, uh, I was watching him do that, and there's just a couple other things that, that I thought of. Um, I remember reading a Chuck Baldwin article from a few years ago when he was talking about Virginia passing the NDAA um, nullification legislation. And, uh, you know, Virginia Governor Bob McDonald says he's on record of opposing the legislation. Well, here's why, and nobody's going to tell you this. We got, got another graphic there. He is on the Council of Governors that Obama started. He picked out 10 governors, two of which aren't even, um, you know, Puerto Rico, I don't believe has been named a state yet. But uh, anyway, Governor Bob McDonald's right there. So that's why you're not going to see him going against the president who picked him to be on this council. That, that's all about political kickbacks. And that Council of Governors is supposedly to create a... Uh, Republican Democrat coalition that comes together to help enforce all the laws that us regular people really don't like. And uh, furthermore, just this past break, you, you watched uh, Luke Radowski confronting Newt Gingrich five times in one video, and he's completely ignoring him when he talks about Bohemian Grove. And then we showed the other video uh, that he did a couple months ago when Newt was kind of in his ascendancy, and now he's kind of floundering in last place, far behind everyone. But, uh, you know, right here we have the book. It was sent in from a listener. This is the Annals of Bohemian Grove, 87 to 96. Okay. And you've got all these pictures. There's a cremation of care. There's Jimmy Carter who came along. Also Jack Kemp. And then there you got Newt inside the book. And you got the two bushes together, like father, like son. And here's another picture we found. You go to this overhead dot cam shot. Here is uh, New Gingrich with John O'Connor in 1995. So there he is right there in the book, in the flesh. It's Nudie. All right. He goes to the Grove. He may not want to admit it. And he didn't even kind of slide off the question by saying, oh, ha, ha, we go there to have gentleman fun. You know, we go there for a gentleman's parties and all that other stuff. No, no, no. He goes there. They do Luciferian worshiping ceremonies worshiping stone owls, and uh, he doesn't want you to know about it. He wants to pretend that he's a, a great man and uh, that you should vote for him for president because he's going to build a moon base and whatnot. One final article. Alex covered this a little bit today, and this was Kurt Haskell brought this to my attention. Trinity speakers say U.S. must share sacrifice, and this is from the San Antonio Express. So you got Alan Simpson and Erskine Biles, a couple of uh, fossil uh, bipartisan members um, who are, well, I'll just read it right here. Simpson, a former U.S. senator from Wyoming, and Bowles, the White House chief of staff under Clinton, say the only way to get the country's finances on a sustainable path is a combination of cutting costs, increasing taxes, and encouraging economic growth. Now, increasing taxes and encouraging economic growth, well, that's not going to happen. You can't encourage economic growth by increasing taxes. That's already been proven. Putting everything from Social Security benefits to defense spending and Medicare on the table. Guess what? They're not going to put defense spending on the table. They're going to put your Social Security and your Medicare on the table. And Simpson and Bowles spoke Tuesday morning as part of the Trin Trinity University's Policy Maker Breakfast Series, zinging a series of jokes and one-liners at an audience of about 500 with a serious message and words politicians use such as shared sacrifice. They say if the country doesn't act, the financial markets will eventually raise the cost of credit, likely turning on a dime and moving without warning, as is happening in Europe. If that happens, the cost of everything from credit card debt to home mortgages, along with the cost of borrowing for the country, will shoot up, and the U.S. will experience a recession like you've never seen before, Boyle said. Simpson said the commission members differed on when they thought the tipping point might come, but no one thought it would be more than two years away. Okay, folks, time to get prepared. So just last year, we had politicians saying that we've got about two years to get our house in order or there's going to be an economic collapse with the way things are going. Now we're going to turn to our guest who has written a book. He's written several books, but this 
particular one that we carried infowars.com survivors talks about what's going to happen after the collapse or what leads up to it and the things that people did to prepare it's uh, survivors by james wesley rawls a novel of the coming collapse and uh Jim Rawls is a former U.S. intelligence officer and survivalist. He's got survivalblog.com, and he's been writing since the mid-'80s, since he got out to college. So let's welcome him on the show. Hey, Jim, how's it going? Just fine. Thanks for having me on. So I read this book, oh, I guess two months ago. Uh, somebody had left it on the, on the book counter, and I, the, the cover is what caught my eye. Uh, you got a guy walking in on a horse. He's got a, an AK with no stock strapped to his back. And, uh, and there's fires and basically, you know, something out of a scene of, uh, of the road looks like he's walking into. So tell us a little bit about Survivors. Sure. Survival, Survivors is a novel set in the near future. Uh, it describes a classic hyperinflation and socioeconomic collapse that's um, very severe. Uh, it brings the power grids down and essentially brings our national economy to a grinding halt. And it's a sequel to my novel, Patriots, uh, which has been kind of a perennial favorite in preparedness circles since the early 90s. And uh, it's, it follows a number of characters uh, and their reactions to the economic collapse and how they scramble to uh, re how they react, how they um, pull through that situation. In my first novel, Patriots, uh, I, I had a, a, the main characters were fairly well prepared. In Survivors, which is set in the exact same time period but different geography, the main characters are not very well prepared for the collapse. And I get uh, the opportunity there to talk about a lot of alternative ways uh, to to get through hard times, right? To techniques and technologies. To me, it, you know, it seems like this book is geared toward people who may have been thinking about these types of issues, but they aren't going into the action phase. They, you know, the the one lady is hoarding seeds. She doesn't really know why, but you know, she's gotten some some advice, and she just she's going to hoard seeds. Um, uh, the one group who has the farm out out in the West, they find that their father was really well prepared when they break open, you know, the wall. I'm giving some of the book away, but they break open this wall and find a cache of silver and guns and, you know, stuff. So it it shows that um, what I like that it, it's not a totally, totally impossible to get yourself prepared. Even if you've only done one or two things, you could still get in that mindset and still continue um, you know, along the path, because, you know, this is something that even our government uh, officials are saying that could happen within two years now. They put a timetable on it. That's right. And uh, of more immediate concern, uh, we're looking at a Greek financial crisis that may come to a head in as little as five weeks. Uh, there's uh, a lot of concern that the Greek crisis could, in addition to just breaking apart the European Union, cause massive bank runs, a major liquidity crisis with cascading margin calls rippling their way all the way around the planet, stock market collapses, uh, bond market uh, problems with failed uh, governmental bond auctions. It could be a, a serious, serious problem. I, I agree. and. What I've been telling people in my circle of friends and the people I know is that what, what you're going to see in Europe, we're two to three years down the line is going to happen here. Uh, we've got a little, I think we, by being so spread out, um, you know, I think there are things that would take longer to hit some places than others. But definitely in the cities, you're going to have, you know, some immediate problems, say, if the electricity goes out for some extended period of time. But um, what, what, in your opinion, what, what is Europe going to do if once these, you know, countries like Greece and then Portugal... Uh, Italy, you know, when these smaller countries start to um, go bankrupt, what, you know, what do you think is going to happen to the rest of Europe? Well, it's very difficult to predict, um, but suffice it to say, I think we could see, at the very minimum, uh, some large bank runs and a collapse uh, on the, uh, the of the FTSE in England and some, all the other major stock indices 
in Europe, starting with the financial stocks, uh, we could very well see considerable turmoil. And if it, if it turns into a global credit collapse, uh, it could have some very wide-reaching repercussions. One of the great imponderables is the derivatives market. There are hundreds of trillions of dollars in derivatives in play at any given time. And because the derivatives market is essentially new, it's really built up just in the last eight years, it really doesn't have a track record. It, it wasn't there uh, in you know, 1987 when they had the, the stock market collapse then. Uh, there was no real derivatives market at that time. Not, not, well, there was a fraction of what exists now. Nothing near the scale that exists now. So the counterparty risk for derivatives is huge. And if entire counterparties disappear and some of those counterparties are actual sovereign risks, as in national governments, if those governments can't meet those obligations, the implications could be enormous. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to your book. One, one of the things I like about the book, and if you guys want to get an overhead shot of this, that'd be great, is, uh, you know, and a lot of people do this, but your, your quotes, I really liked each one, and I had to read a couple of them several times over. But in chapter three, you have a you know, Thomas Jefferson quote, probably one most people have seen. If the American people ever allow private banks to control uh, the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and the corporations will grow up around them, will deprive the people of all their property until their children wake up homeless and the continent their fathers conquered. The issuing power should be taken from the banks and restored to the people to whom it properly belongs. Now, yeah, that I think is actually a paraphrase because they didn't use the terms inflation and deflation in that time period, but it is a good one. Yeah. Well, I liked how you started each chapter with one of those and, and how, you know, you, you've, got the, you've got the one character who's in the, um, he's in the army overseas and he's got to make his way back through a Europe that has also collapsed and uh, using gold and silver. Uh, talk about some of the things. I forget his, the character's name right off the top of my head. His name is Andy Lane. He's an army captain right. who's released from active duty in Afghanistan just as the collapse is unfolding. And uh, he's sent back to Germany uh, as part of his out processing. And, but then he ends up getting stranded and he's, there's all the commercial flights have been grounded both because of the economic turmoil and because of some hijackings and bombing terrorism that's going on. Uh, there's no flights going back to the United States. Uh, even the military airlift command flights uh, have been totally disrupted. So he has to find his way back to the United States in the midst of all of this. It, it makes for a pretty dramatic story. It does, because he doesn't come right back to the United States. He has to yeah, make his way. The story away, but... yeah. So so he has really great adventures on the way. He does, and, it, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a great book. Um, uh, one of the other parts is, is the bad guys in this, is a, is a roving gang that just grows and grows and grows as, as it goes and just conquers each kind of holdout uh, settlement. What, what kind of research did you do into um, you know, this gang type of, of well, warfare that could happen? I was researching uh, MS-13, which is a, a particularly violent gang, and uh, their modus operandi really isn't too much different in the novel from what they do today, except in, if you end up in a situation without rule of law, where there's a vacuum of law enforcement, the gangs will have the opportunity to you know, run rampant and uh, take over entire towns. Uh, there'll be basically no one to stop them. Uh, other than the local citizenry, and if they can overpower or intimidate them, uh, I think there's a potential for gangs taking over at least small towns uh, quite easily. Mm -hmm. And that's what I portrayed in the book. Right. I yeah. until the third book, uh, where I describe that, the, the comeuppance of that gang, uh, people have to wait for uh, my second sequel to Patriots, which is titled, titled Founders. That's coming out in November of this year. Okay. And... Um one, one more um, section in, uh, in Survivors that I thought was uh, interesting was, was um, the way people were, were forming bonds and communities out of necessity. Um, people would show up and they had supplies that would help 
with another group, uh, specifically the, the two, the husband and wife who are flying in their, their little flying machines and ending up in places, and, and then they pick up and, and take off. Go, I guess, what, what's the mindset of people, you know, the mindset of people that are going to have to rebuild communities? What, what is going to happen if, if, you know, we do get into a crunch situation? Well, in the crunch, I think people are going to have to either pull together or perish. Uh, there really needs, that if there's any, going to be any rebuilding, it really needs to be done from the bottom up. If the experience of Hurricane Katrina taught us anything, it is that, dis, is that disaster response fails horribly when it's from the top down. Right. But the response from the bottom up, from the community grassroots level, can be quite effective. And in both my novel Patriots and later in Survivors, I described how people do that. Well, and I noticed that there's not a lot of government um, solutions in, in this book. There, in fact, there seems to be a lack of government. Oh, the the um, second part of it where the, uh, um, just like in Patriots, uh, there's a uh, foreign occupational army uh, that comes in, and there's a war of resistance against them. But that's the only real government that springs up. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of top-down government, and it's bad government, and uh, a lot of the drama in both novels involves uh, trying to restore constitutional government. So, what got you started into writing on these subjects? Um, what what was your uh, what was your impetus for that? I was an army intelligence officer, and uh, a lot of my research, and some of which was in the classified arena. Uh, led me to believe that modern societies are very fragile. And I recognized in, in all these country studies, seeing country after country, where the fragility of the system uh, can meet a brick wall <laughs> and things can fall apart very quickly and easily. Uh, it's happened again and again all over the world. And then I recognized the fact that our own society was even more fragile because we have even longer chains of supply. We have an even greater dependence upon the power grids in particular and technology in general. And that's why in the winter of 1990, 1991, I began drafting my novel Patriots. So you saw the handwriting on the wall of something that could potentially happen. Right. If, uh, well, some things we can't stop. I know that we, we could, we can, uh, at least speak out against our governments that are, and, and the banking systems that look like they are imploding this stuff by design on purpose and uh, just so they can go around and collect up the pieces after they fall. Um, yes. In my conversation with Alex Jones earlier this week, uh, part of our conjecture was whether uh, there might be a planned economic collapse, but uh, both Alex and I wondered if that situation might get beyond their control. Mm -hmm. They might stage a crisis as part of the Hegelian dialectic, but then if the, if the reins of power get out of their hands, if society collapses so completely that there's no longer a functioning military, no longer a functioning law enforcement system, and no longer a functioning financial system, Basically, it's out of their hands. They, they basically have created a house of cards. It will fall be in front of them, and they won't be the ones putting things back together. Right. No, it's going to be up to us. And, and that's what people have to look in the mirror and realize that the solutions are not going to come from the government. They're not going to come from the police. These guys are going to be trying to protect their families, as you point out in, in your book, um, at, at this Air Force base. Uh, all of a sudden, there was nobody there minding uh, the armory, you know, and, and that's because these people are going to be running to the hills as well or trying to take care of, of their families and their loved ones. Right. It is important that people plan ahead and that they stock up and train as best as they can. It'll only be the families that are well prepared where you'll have people that can keep an eye on the big picture. Right. Be part of the real solution. Because if you're worried about where you're going to get your next meal, you're not going to be any position to uh, be one of the ones that is restoring order. Well, You'll let's go into some of those things. What can some people do to prepare? What are like a, a top five, I guess, that people can do right now? Um, the top you know? of the list would be uh, water filtration, 
and identifying open water sources that you can draw water from. And then beyond that, of course, food storage, uh, starting out by just doubling up on the staple foods that you buy on a regular basis, things like pasta, uh, you know, wheat, rice, beans, honey, things that store for a long period of time. And then beyond that, uh, moving on to longer um, term storage foods, uh, some of those, can, uh, if they're vacuum packed, uh, freeze dried foods, they can have up to a 30 year shelf life. They're fairly expensive though, compared to just bulk foods. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, uh, of course, first aid and advanced medical equipment, communications equipment, and firearms. Lots and lots of ammo in particular is, is crucial. Yeah, I'm going to share a story with you. I've, I've got a couple friends who, who uh, they say when they're, some of their other friends go over and say, why do you have so many guns? They say, well, I have a gun for you, and I have a gun for him, and I have a gun for this guy down the street, because you guys don't have any. And, you know, they're prepared, and I'm prepared, uh, not nearly as much as I should be. I think you could always do a little bit more to get prepared, and especially as you see, you know, the writing on the wall, that something bad could very well happen in the next, uh, you know, couple of years, next three or four years. I mean, we are kind of walking this fine line with, with the technology, with, you know, the electrical grid. I mean, the sun could knock everything out. You never know. It, could, it might not even be a government or a terrorist that, that gets us. It could just be the sun decides it it's, wants to shoot out a few flares and, and knocks everything out. And then, you know, where are you going to be? That's right. Well, uh, you touched on something that's pretty important, and that is uh, having extra on hand for charity. Uh, charity is one of the themes that runs through all of my writings. And if you're going to go overboard in any area, you can't go too far wrong with extra food, extra fuel, and extra ammunition. Because if you missed out on stocking up on anything, uh, if you overlooked anything, you can make up for that with barter. And there's nothing quite like common caliber ammunition as the ultimate barter item. All right. Most families only have a few a few hundred rounds of ammunition at most on hand, they're suddenly going to want several thousand rounds. Mm -hmm. You'll save. So if you have extra common caliber ammunition, you're going to be in the catbird seat in terms of barter. And um, a little tidbit out there, I, th I believe nine millimeter is the most common um, handgun ammunition. Is that correct? It is now globally, yes. Uh, although one thing I recommend is that people do some research and find out what caliber their local police department and their local sheriff's department uses. And even if you don't own a gun chambered in those calibers, stock up a few hundred rounds of those because uh, you want to have uh, lots of folks on your side. Not nothing better than being able to, to either have barter or uh, charity ammunition on hand. Yeah, I agree. Hey, tell everyone about your blog. Well, Survival Blog has been around since August of 2005. We got our start uh, providentially just a month before Hurricane Katrina. And it's grown by leaps and bounds. It's basically doubled each year for the last, uh, for the first four years it was in existence and it started to plateau now. But uh, we now have oh, a, a huge number of visits uh, each week. Uh, we have a, um, a very loyal readership. It's uh, primarily readers in the U.S. and Canada, uh, and then to a lesser extent, other English-speaking countries, and then a, a smattering uh, globally. We have about 300,000 unique visits per week. Uh, we've, in total, had almost 40 million unique visitors since 2005. And the beauty of Survival Blog is that it's all free. All of the archives are available for people to roam through at will. It's fully searchable by topic. Uh, you can type in a keyword in our search box and bring up whatever topic you'd like. There's over 15,000 archived articles, letters, and quotes that people can uh, delve into. And I recommend that people make hard copies of the most crucial articles because, of course, in a grid down situation, you're not going to have access to the Internet. Uh, and then as a backup, we also have an archive CD that's available at very low cost. Uh, I recommend people get that as well. That gives you all the archives of Survival Blog on a CD, or you can put it on a memory stick uh, to have that available. I have been printing stuff out for years, just because you never know. Um, lots of practical stuff, how to, you know, Paper make your own fishing snares and stuff like that. 
<laughs> yeah, you, uh, I, there's nothing beats a, a hard copy for for uh, long term. And, and you can always burn it if you need to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to keep warm. God forbid. Yeah. Um, you know, you've traveled across the country, you've interviewed, uh, interviewed people, you've been on speaking engagements. How many people across the country do you think are, are in that preparedness state of mind? I mean, we've, have, we've got shows on, uh, on the cable networks now talking about people who are getting prepared and, and stuff like that. So it's kind of entering the vernacular a little bit, but what's your... It's, it is entering the, the national psyche, but in terms of real practical, tangible preparedness, there's a lot more people interested in preparedness than those who've actually gotten off their tail and done anything about it. I'd say in terms of people that are actually tangibly preparing, I'd say it's only about 2% of the population, mm. which is kind of pitiful, yeah. but it's better than nothing. And each person that, that gets prepared represents one less person who's going to be rushing into the grocery store at the 11th hour and cleaning out the shelves. So everyone who stocks up now is part of the solution, not part of the problem. That's true. Um, it, are you looking at any timetables in particular? Are you seeing anything that's telling you something might be coming up? What, what do you have on your radar? Well, right now, my most immediate concern is Greece and uh, the, the Greek debt situation spiraling out of control. But beyond that, um, it's really hard to put a date on anything. You know, back in uh, the late 1990s, we, we had the firm date of Y2K to look at. Uh, the only vague date uh, that we can look at right now would be the next peak in the solar cycle. Uh, the sunspot cycle is supposed to peak in about five years because it's you know an 11-year cycle. And if we have a, a severe cycle, then there's a chance of a, of a major Carrington event-style solar flare that could happen within the next five years. Beyond that, though, I don't like to put a date on anything because I, I think it's presumptuous and it also is short-sighted because if you either try to put a date on something or name a particular scenario, you're boxing yourself in. It's better to prepare for every possible event so that you don't get blindsided. It would be very embarrassing to prepare just for an economic collapse and then get nuked. Mm -hmm. uh, that if, if you're building a, a home shelter, it should be more than just a storm shelter. It should be more than just a walk-in vault. It should also be a combination blast and fallout shelter. I, I'm one of those all of the above kind of guys. Well, that, that sounds like good advice. Um, and people can learn more about that on survivalblog.com, I take it. Correct, yes, and it's all available free, as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. I do have some books in print, and they're nice, handy references, and they're a great thing to put in someone's hands to get them motivated. But I'm basically a man on a mission. I, my goal is not to sell books. My goal is to get America prepared. Right. And that's where we all need to be. I, I, was, a, I was an Eagle Scout, and that's our motto, be prepared. You know, and that's what you have to start with. And uh, uh, I, I just recently returned from a ski trip, and we got off the plane. Um, one of my buddies didn't have his straps for his uh, snowboard. Well, I pulled out the bungee cords because I always carry bungee cords. And, okay. uh, you know, it, it all starts with the mindset and then you got to go into the action phase. Jim right. Rawls, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, we'll have you back on soon, and I'm sure you have a lot to talk about. So I'm sure Alex may even have you in uh, uh, guest hosting one day. So. Oh, sure, I'd be happy to. That'd Thank be you. Great. All right, there he goes. There's Jim Rawls. Here's the book, Survivors. I read it. It's a combination uh, fiction novel with a lot of practical tips involved of things you can do today to get in that mindset so you are a survivor so you're not somebody left out in the cold when it happens uh, before we leave we got the daily quote and this is from the book chapter i think this is i forget what chapter i think it's chapter five of of survivors and it's from john adams the government turns every contingency into an excuse for enhancing power in itself and that is from survivors you can pick it up at Infowars.com. I recommend you get it. It's a great book. Um, I read it in about, oh, two weeks off and on, and it's got a lot of great tips. So 
There you go. Don't be don't be left out in the cold. Start preparing today. I'm preparing. Uh, reading that article um, earlier today about uh, the Trinity. The Trinity speakers say U.S. must share sacrifice. That really started putting a timetable, at least in my head. Um, before I was just kind of planning for general events, but now I am looking at actual, you know, an actual timetable that we have to start looking at. Because if we don't change our ways, if it's all about increasing taxes and increasing the debt and not doing anything about that and you know the economy is not going to grow therefore there's not going to be any change in where we're going and when the chips fall the bankers are going to be there picking stuff up pretending like they didn't know it was going to happen so that's our show if you're watching this on youtube please consider becoming a member at prisonplanet.tv or infowarsnews.com and we do this five days a week Every night we're bringing you the news that we think is important, not the fluff about who's, who's talking about who or who's doing what to who. I mean, we're looking at real issues here. And uh, join us in this crusade to wake people up. Let's get people prepared out there. Let's not sit around and, and pretend we didn't hear it, we don't know anything, and then when it finally happens, you know, we're going to wish we have done something. We're going to wish we have bought that you know, some storable food, got some silver, got some firearms, learned how to use the firearms properly. I mean, it's one thing to get a handgun. It's another thing to know how to clean it, take it apart, load it under duress, and fire and hit your target. So with that, I'm Rob Dew. This is InfoWars Nightly News. I'd like to thank Paul Joseph Watson for uh, doing the news portion. And we'll be back here next week. Alex will be out on the road. He's got two speaking engagements, one in Dallas and one in Orlando uh, the next two Sundays coming up. So we'll have a variety of guests anchoring the InfoWars Nightly News. I'll be one of them, Aaron Dykes. We're going to get McBreen back in here and uh, possibly even John Bound. who you've heard his voice on a few projects, but uh, I think we're going to get him in here, sit him down, reading the news under the lights of the InfoWars studios. That's all for now. I'm Rob Dew. Thanks for watching and be sure to check out prisonplanet.tv.